we enlist the help of experts to get under the skin of some of the most important areas of technology and digital transformation for today's digital leaders. My name is Kate Russell and today we are taking on the digital gender gap. It is a huge topic. A recent government report shows that only 15.5% of STEM workforce in Britain are women. That's excluding the medical uh, professions. Um, but that figure actually plummets to just 8% when it comes to engineers. So what's going wrong? Well, to help me get to the bottom of things, we have three fantastic guests, all brilliant women working in the digital sector. We have Jacqueline Dorocas, who is digital executive with Citrix. She has Citrix, sorry. She has over 25 years of experience in leading technology businesses. Anne Watson is CEO elect for Semta. She takes over the role in January, having been with the organisation since 1998. And Alison McLaughlin is Head of Public Sector Industry and Services for SOPRA and plays a key role in public sector ICT policy and its implementation. So thank you very much for joining me. Um, it's great to have you on Google Hangouts today. Um, before we come to the crux of the issue though, I just want to give our guests a chance to put forward their own position um, so that you get an idea of where they fit into the picture um, contextually. So Jacqueline, I'd like if I may to start with you. Um, can you tell us about the work that you've been doing to support women in tech from the boardroom perspective? Yeah, so um, I work at Citrix Systems, but I'm also the board champion for women at Tech UK. Um, and I run the manifesto there for um, creating more women in the FTSE 350 boardroom. Um, and um, three other uh, very specific programs for getting women returners into the workplace after a maternity break, um, plus getting young girls to choose um, digital related subjects when they're obviously at the um, uh, age when they can choose their subjects. And the third one is challenging business on what they're going to be doing to support women in technology. So it's a four point manifesto um, and a very busy agenda that is looks like it's reaping results and uh, we need more women in tech, that's my position. We certainly do, and um, I would will come back to that. There's loads I want to ask you about that, but let's go to Anne now. Anne, tell us about the work that SEMTA is doing and why it's so important right now. Oh, SEMTA is doing lots of work, Kate, and we very much work with government, education, and the industry. Um, the engineering sector needs a million more scientists, technicians, engineers by 2020, and we're just not um, producing enough, be they their, be their boys or girls, male or female. Um, and the, the female population is hugely important to, to filling that uh, that skills gap within STEM. Um, work is going on. Um, SEMTA is working with employers, um, actively promoting young women as role models. Um, so this week we have the, the skills show at the NEC where we have for the first time in, in the history of the engineering competitions actually got young ladies competing in, in engineering subjects um, so they will be fantastic role models for all the young people at school age going through that. Um, in addition we have um, lots of videos on the, the SEMTA website from organisations like BAE Systems um, and other organisations showing young women in engineering roles. Um, we saw yesterday the government um, launching the Your Life campaign um, which is to get more young people um, studying STEM subjects with a particular focus on girls um, and great to see their website where there's lots of pictures of female engineers and female role models um, and the other aspect that the SEMTA is doing is the SEMTA Skills Awards um, launched last year it was fantastic that the Apprentice of the Year and Higher Apprentice of the Year were both females, both female apprentices um, so I do think although there's lots of work to do the tide is definitely turning Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, and finally, Alison, um, what about the work that SOPRA has been doing to increase the representation of women in its workforce? Well, Robin from Digital Leaders invited me to join in this event when he visited our office in Edinburgh and was struck by the number of women we had in the office and in particular the number of senior women. Um, but SOPRA is a French IT services company and I have to say at the group level the answer is not very much. In fact, when I attend regular senior management meetings in France, 
there might be about 80 people there and about six of us are women and half of those in the more traditional roles of HR and marketing or whatever. But in the UK that is very different. Um, and we had made quite an impact at group level when we announced our structure last year and three out of the five people at the top in the leadership group for the UK were women. And I think that is actually the main significant thing we do that does encourage more women is because we have a significant representation of women at the senior levels. And we're currently running about 20% of our technical workforce um, as women, so it's still not great. But looking at some of the stats, it, it's healthier than most. Um, and it's gratifying to see as well that 30% of our graduate intake were women over the last two years as well. So I think some of the things we're doing is we don't specifically go out to attract more women, but we do make a point of when we are at different fairs or recruiting that we um, represent a mix in our team. So there'll be women and, and men in the teams so that it's not just all men or women and we're a bit... Um, we notice what we do with that. So we don't actively say we want more women and this is a target, but I think because there just are more of us, particularly leadership roles, we tend to attract and retain more women perhaps than, than other organisations. You know, it's funny because that's a, a, a sentiment or a, you know, a happening that is a recurring theme is just generally in environments where there are more women, it tends to attract more women. But we've got yeah. to get over those first stumbling blocks to actually Absolutely. create that initial blossom. Okay, discussion point one then, and we're going to sort of come to all of you across the three discussion points. I want to talk first about the current balance that we experience in the UK workforce. Now, science and engineering are major contributors to the prosperity of uh, our country, around 800 billion a year to the UK economy, and 10% of the world's top scientific research happens in this country. Um, now this has led the coalition government to state that for our prosperity to continue, the government believes that we need high levels of science, technology, engineering, and maths, STEM subjects, um, as well as citizens that value them. So, easy statement to make, right, on the surface of it, but not so easy to achieve. Um, who wants to pick this up first? Maybe Jacqueline, what, you know, what's your experience? Because obviously you're, you're at boardroom level, um, you know, and, and, and the tech sector really suffers at boardroom level specifically um, with, with female leaders. What do you think needs to be done to encourage more people to look to STEM as a career choice? Yeah, so I think it starts at the top. I think, um, you know, it's very difficult to turn the tide at boardroom if you haven't caught it at STEM level, for one, but we are where we are. And I think we certainly need more female leaders choosing other female leaders in our businesses. And what, what we see in the boardroom a lot is we see a little bit of tokenism um, with not a sustainable succession plan in place. So, you know, once you lose that token CEO or um, token female on the board, there's not a great deal of planning that's gone into place to retain that gender diversity uh, on the board. So, so that's a big issue and I think one that we need to challenge business on, frankly. Um, and I think most businesses would say that that's something that they really need to look at. Um, and, you know, at Tech UK, we need to um, find a way to continue to challenge business on that. By the way, most people are very open to that. Um, and most people believe that the boardroom is a worse place for it for not having that diversity aspect in, in, their, in their teams because the markets we serve are obviously very diverse too. And, um, you know, we need that female talent there. I think part of what we also have to do is to challenge the people putting the short list together for the boardroom. Um, so, you know, the recruiters, the executive search firms who are putting short lists together need to steer clear of proximity hiring and sort of spread their net a little bit further onto the next generation talent. We've got some really talented women who don't necessarily actually think they're ready for the boardroom, but probably are. Um, because of their common sense and practicality capabilities. So, you know, I would say that um, part of my job and a lot of, lot of the work that I do is to get next generation talent into, the, into a shortlist scenario with exec recruiters so that they can socialize with that new talent. Um, otherwise, it's the same old people that we normally get to talk to and, that, and that's not great for getting new people, new faces on the board. 
It did, there's an element as well. I mean, we're, we're talking here role models, right? We're talking here, yeah. you know, having women in industry, that, that young girls and also young young women coming through um, their, the early parts of their career can aspire to be like. And it's really important to have great uh, role models for women, women. But I'm sort of getting the sense more and more that actually in some ways there needs to be a really good structure of role models for men too and boys too to learn how to make the atmosphere more inclusive and acceptable for women. Um, you're nodding, Jacqueline. Is that something that you yourself have, have, have found? What I discovered when I first started um, looking at the issue was that women were talking to women um, only about this issue. And there are lots of women-only forums. And um, all of the work that I do now engages men as well. And I think, you know, it's very... It's very tricky. It's, it's good to vent in a room full of women, um, but I actually think it's great to be inclusive um, with males in the room who can alter um, the outcome um, and also be open to the fact that, you know, there is a gender gap, there is a gender opportunity. Um, and let's face it, all men have women in their lives in some way. It could be daughters, nieces, you know, sisters, mothers, whatever. Um, and, I, and I absolutely believe that they also... Um, you know, really believe that there should be an opportunity, an equal opportunity for women to thrive in our, our industry as well. Um, but we do need to be inclusive, not exclusive. And I think that's really, really important when we're, when we're going forward with this agenda. Absolutely. Now, Anne, I know that, um, you know, Centre, I was at your uh, launch a couple of weeks ago for the STEM Alliance. Um, can you tell me just a, a brief, briefly what that, the plan is for that uh, new initiative? Oh, your microphone's gone on to mute there. There you Sorry, go. That's it. Yes, the STEM Alliance is, is all about collaboration. I think it's recognising that there's lots and lots of initiatives around STEM and, and trying to get young people and, and the education sector to engage more with industry. And this is very much about pulling it all together and partnership working. So there are a number of different strands to that. Um, one is around recruitment and retention and particularly encouraging more people to see post 16 teaching um, as a good career prospect and particularly Jacqueline touched on it women returners um, got lots of women who have gone through the engineering sector and dropped out to start a family and, and struggling to get back in um, other strands of the project is around continuous um, continuous professional development for those people who are teaching our young people um, because many of those particularly at post 16 a professional engineers, professional scientists, but it's been many years since they were in the workforce and we need them to be up to date with what modern day STEM looks like so that they can inspire the young people of the future. As you said, both boys and girls, but we really need to, to engage. Everything around us has been engineered or STEM has touched it on, in some shape or form and I think to some extent we're blind to the, the feats of, of STEM engineering and technology that's around us because they've become everyday objects. You know, it's really difficult in education, and this is a conversation I have a lot with, you know, teachers, the teaching profession, and that is, when you're teaching particularly technology, computer science, you know, the foundations of, of a lot of these sort of like really interesting tech jobs, the subject moves on so quickly that actually you almost have to retrain with all the latest technologies, platforms, digital devices, almost every year as a teacher, whereas, you know, if you're teaching history, pretty much the curriculum remains the same year on year. There seems to be an awful lot of pressure with a lot of curriculum changes and drive to get sort of, you know, better education in, in, in STEM subjects. But is enough being done to support the teachers, to give them the time and the backing that they need to actually be, you know, sort of more knowledgeable than their students at the end of the day, which is always a little bit, you know, if you go into a classroom and your students know more than you, then you're bound to feel a little sort of unsure of yourself. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Kate, particularly at post-16 where our young people are starting to look at apprenticeships and the vocational route and are actually in the workforce. It's absolutely important that, that those, te those teachers who are mentoring them and coaching them and teaching them are, actually have access to the technology. Uh, and one of the other strands of the STEM Alliance project is to say to industry and say to the employers, 
this is your problem as much as it is education's. If you want good quality education at post 16 for your future workforce, the future industrialists, then you need to get involved. So one of the challenges that we've laid down for the for the employers is to say sign up to a register, offer work placements or secondments, day release, or even just open the factory doors or the, the doors to the manufacturing site or the office, um, just so, so the, the teaching profession can come in and have a look. Um, at post 16, the, the, the minimum amount of continuous professional development is on average 30 hours a year, which is less than an hour a week. Uh, and as you say, it, it's quite shocking, so we do need to do more, but a lot of that is with industry and employers to open their doors and let the education world have a look. So then I guess what we're saying is if you're, a, if you're a business sitting here, and we hear this a lot, you know, businesses in the UK particularly, there's a skills shortage. We can't find enough technically trained people and scientifically trained people to fill the jobs. So if you're a business in that position, then they need to come, they need to proactively come to someone like you, to the STEM Alliance, and say, I'm offering my business to help encourage the next generation. Is that is that what we're saying? Is it really as simple as that, just saying businesses get out of your boardroom chairs and go and speak to the organisations who are trying to put you together with educators. Is it that simple? Um, it can be. I mean, I would encourage all employees who are interested, um, visit the SEMTA website, semta.org.uk. There's information there about the STEM Alliance, where employers can register their interest. And then SEMTA will do the rest. We will then um, put them in touch with the register so they can give an indication of, of how much or how little they're willing to do. Um, and we will then make that offering available to their local FE colleges and work-based provision and, and hopefully be that to bring the, the conduit between industry and education together. But we've got okay. to start somewhere. And presumably that applies for, for teachers and those in education as well. Okay, Alison, I'm going to come to you. Um, so in March, the government invested 300 million to support growth in jobs in, in, in UK science and technology. With every one pound spent on research, expected to generate 50p for the wider economy year on year. Sounds great. How's it going? Do we know? I mean, it's, it's March now. Has there been any kind of movement? I still hear all the time industry crying out there's not enough. Um, I was just in meetings this morning, even just talking about in Scotland we're worried there's not enough people coming through. A lot of new businesses struggling saying I need you know, good opportunities for great businesses, can't get the staff to do the jobs to meet the business demand. So I think there's a load more needs to be done. I think there's also, yes it's about teaching, but there's also the image and awareness of a lot of science and, and you know, my own area of, of IT I think. I think it's all, all often roles that are hidden and people don't even think of that as being a career choice or they think of it as something that's about sitting at a computer, you know, with a bunch of guys writing code and there's such a broad range of jobs that you can do within IT and science and I don't know that there's, it's not even just about the subjects themselves but what they do and the impact they have that I think that, that there could be a lot more done to sort of improve or be more visible the kind of opportunities that there are for people to encourage not just girls but generally more, more people into, into these kind of roles. No, I found it interesting. I read an interesting article, uh, I think it was last month, uh, where made.com, the um, homemade or the sort of like uh, um, uh, individually made furniture people, they did a study of their own recruitment process and they looked at the semantics in their um, adverts for jobs. And originally, initially, and they were trying to attract more women into to apply for jobs. And originally, they looked at the sort of like the words that they used and removed all of this sort of you know sort of go getty, fighty, you know sort of winners, it's sort of you know specul um, things that they were looking for. And that raised it a bit, but not very much. But one of the things that they they found was that women have a tendency if they see a list of a shopping list of job requirements on a on an application, if they can't do some of them, they'll go oh well I can't do some of those. Whereas the men they found tended to go, well, I can do three out of five, so I'll apply. <laughs> um, I mean, it, it really can be as simple as that. Is, is that something, Alison, that we can, you know, we can perhaps structure a little more solidly to, to, to get out there, that kind of information? Yes, I think so. And I think you can see us all nodding at that, something we all recognise in 
you know, I see it in women in my own teams in terms of encouraging them to, to go for promotions and, and even in myself right, in terms of um, for going for that. So I think, yes, there probably is more we could do about understanding how to appeal to women to sort of make them come forward. And, you know, are you interested in these things? Do you like doing these kind of things? Then this could be for you rather than can you do tick, 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 tick. I think that might be a more uh, a, a approach that might appeal to more, make it more approachable. Absolutely. Hey, we've got some questions coming in. And by the way, if you've got any questions, um, do tweet them at DigiLeaders and uh, put the hashtag at uh, hashtag DigiLeaders. You can see it there on, the, on my fingers wangling, waggling underneath it um, slightly randomly. Um, so we've got a question that's coming from um, Jules who said, now this is an interesting one because social media tends to be now, you know, we, we've all heralded it as the way to get the message out, you know, sort of on mass quickly, inexpensively. Um, but um, Jules actually asked, is social media robust enough to promote the work of organisations working on promoting STEM inclusivity? And that's interesting because we do all tend to go, oh, I've got something to say, put it on social media. But maybe social media is actually not reaching enough people. What do we think? Maybe I can ask Anne, I'm going to ask you because you're looking, looking like you might have something to say. Yes, I mean, I, I think it's not necessarily social media. I think um, generally, I think the, the the STEM arena and particularly the employers have, have still got to, to embrace social media more. Um, I do think when it's used in the right way, it can have fantastic results. Um, but it is very much around the, the people who are directing the social media having more of an insight into the people that they're actually trying to engage with. Um, and one of the, the initiatives that SEMTA has is the Industry Apprentice Council, um, which is great. It's a real mix of female and, and, and male apprentices. Um, and it's very much about encouraging more young people into engineering and STEM through the apprenticeship route. So it's not seen as kind of plan B rather than plan A going to university. Um, and they do particularly well because they're the same as the people that they're trying to engage with. Um, so I don't necessarily think it's the social media per se. I think organisations and particularly engineering companies have got a lot to learn about how to better engage the, pe the people they're trying to reach um, through these new channels. And it's I not think that's true, actually. Just, I'm just adding to that, Kate, which is that you know, part of why social media works is because it creates communities, exactly um, what was just being said. And I, I, you know, I think that that's really important that you can't just put it out there and fling it out there and expect that cyberspace is going to do its thing. I think by creating communities of people with like-minded issues, opportunities, challenges, then that's when the viral nature of social media becomes, you know, really potent and, and super leveraged. Um, if, if we just think that, you know, if you open a shop on the internet and just, and just you know, hope that someone's going to come and visit you without creating a community, it's never going to work. And the same is true of you know, digital communities to promote STEM or to promote like-minded issues. I think you've got to create that community feel, otherwise it's going to go nowhere. I don't think you get something for nothing. Yeah, so true. <laughs> so true. Having said that, though, you know, it's ju it's not that we lack the entrepreneurial gene because the recent figures from Kickstarter shows that the women are behind 65% of successful crowdfunding campaigns on that platform. And over on Indiegogo, their statistics show that female-led campaigns consistently outperform male-led cam cam campaigns, achieving higher um, uh, higher pledges and, and more amounts of pledges. Um, so we don't lack the entrepreneurial gene um, and actually um, uh, Yasmin um, has said, um, oh sorry, so Susan has said, how do we get more women into management positions? Now interestingly Susan's not just talking about um, STEM here, you know, presumably she's talking generally because, you know, I mean I think this is a problem across the workforce, isn't it, right? I think it is. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm going just back to a subject that you talked about earlier, which is how do we describe jobs when, when we put them out there. There was an interesting study done, I can't remember where it was from, but it, it said when job descriptions um, aimed at men talk about job title and salary, those were the top two things that men really were interested in first. And it's a sweeping generalization, I know, and I apologize. But for women, the top two were location, i.e. can their small army of helpers that help them run their day and their home and their family move with them and the job 
And the second one was what were the career opportunities throughout um, their time at the, at the new opportunity. And I think that's quite telling as well um, in terms of things that are important and different. Um, but going back to the women, um, how we get more managers in positions, I, I go back to this point, which is that um, you know we definitely need um, to have women in leadership positions choosing women. Um, and also, you know, I think Madeleine Albright said there's a special place in hell for women who don't help other women. Um, and that's really important too because I have experienced um, some women um, at the top of the tree who have got their, you know, crawled over broken glass to get there and they're not going to make it easy for anybody else of any gender. Um, and I think that's, you know, they're few and far between, but I think we are, you know, we are responsible as role models, mentors, putting, putting it out there to give someone a hand up. Um, the tree is also another way of getting more women uh, in leadership positions or management positions at the very least, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, let's move on to education um, because this was really the second point of discussion that I wanted to cover today. STEM subjects and the graduates that read them are absolutely vital for the future of the UK's digital sector. Um, and actually, in the 2013-14 academic year, 98,000 students were accepted onto STEM undergraduate courses, highest level ever recorded, and an 8% rise from the previous academic year. But only 12% of those were uh, engineering and technology undergraduates were women. So although you know we're doing positive work to try and attract more people to plug the skills gap that we're suffering from, it still seems that we're missing the mark in terms of education, encouraging girls into STEM subjects. So what what is going on there? Um, maybe Alison, would you like to, to pick this up for me? What, what do you think is stopping girls from studying STEM? Um, well, I think it's pr probably a lot of stereotypes and images of what that's going to be like. I mean, I myself studied engineering, and, and you know, before we came on air, we, we were talking about, you know, do girls own the clubs help things? The reason I did engineering was because when I was at school, I went and had a course specifically encouraging girls to do engineering, and it was all girls, and we had a great time. And then I thought, I'm going to do that, that sounds good. When I went to the university then, and I was one of about eight girls in a class of 150, if I'd known it was going to be that extreme, I think that might have put me off. It was low, you know, it's tough enough to go to university, and engineering is a nine to five, five day a week course. There's not a huge amount of time to be doing extracurricular activities, so pretty much the French make the people in your class and, and when you're there and you're you know away from home from first time and you're a bit isolated that can be even more isolating so I think we probably do need ways to kind of encourage maybe more girls communities through the unit and encouraging girls to, to, to do that but I think there is a lot of you know preconceptions of what it's going to be and some of them might actually be valid so we perhaps need to do things within the courses to support the girls and there was a bigger um, number of rooms I don't know if this still is the case that there is more probably proportionally girls dropping out than the boys as well, perhaps just because hanging around in that you know very male environment all those years is just operating. So perhaps there's more we can do to encourage the girls who are there to take them by you know you know I hate the idea of doing things just for girls and not for boys, but you know maybe it helps. Well, this is it, and um, you know we, you've already expressed yourself in your own experience in the workplace that the very um, act of having more women. Uh, you know, in existence means more women are attracted to it. Actually, Emma Mulqueeny, for uh, the founder of um, a Rewired State, had an interesting experience in 2012, um, where they were trying to encourage more girls to sign up for their hackathon weekends, and so they made an issue out of it. They, you know, they made a campaign saying, "Not enough girls, sign up." Sign ups for girls actually dropped from five percent to three percent through that, and and Emma actually said um, she she did a statement in um, uh, the Guardian in 2012 that said it was because I shed light on it being a more male thing, and that's like social suicide. They think you'll only get nerdy girls if it's boy dominated. So this seems to me it's kind of almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yasmin, um, oh, I keep wanting to go to Yasmin, uh, it was John. John said, do gender neutral toys really encourage more women to go into STEM related jobs as well? So um, what do we think on that? Anyone? Um, I'll have a go at this one. I mean, I, th I think really only time will tell. Um, 
gender neutral toys are something that um, is, is something that is, is fairly new particularly to the UK and we haven't really I think had the the benefit of actually seeing what what they, they do in, in terms of um, encouraging more girls into STEM subjects. I mean, I think generally, I, I believe they've got to be a good thing because it does start to, to break down the stereotypes. Um, but I, I think we've yet to see the research or the solid evidence base that says having gender, gender neutral toys will actually encourage more girls into, into STEM because I think there's other barriers we need to break down. Friends, family, perceptions of what, what STEM is like. You could have a gender neutral toy, but if you're, you're your parents are still see an engineering um, career as dirty, greasy as it was back in the 1970s, um, th then having different toys won't help. Amy has a good question. My daughter is eight years old. How can I engage her in STEM subjects? Now, this has to be the million dollar question, right, Jacqueline? Yeah, I think it is interesting, but you know, there are some really cool role models out there as well um, in the media. I think, I mean, even from you know Lisa Simpson in The Simpsons. I mean, she's a geeky, geeky character on the television. You've got you know um, Freaks and Geeks, which is you know t TV phenomenon. You've got Holly Smale, Felicity uh, Smoke, and I. You know, you look at all of those funny um, role models. They're quite cool. Um, girls aspire to them. I think there's increasing cool geeks geek girls on the television and actually those can also serve as role models as well as ones in our own you know sort of small circle and network so I think that will help too so if you want to you know I guess that the answer to that one um, would be John you know watch The Simpsons but uh, it's, it's a bit of a try to answer <laughs> it helps though. Uh, you know it's, it's it, we look at education and we talk about you know the, the lack of girls studying um, STEM subjects and you think well maybe maybe girls and women aren't taking up undergraduate study as, as much but actually um, statistics from the Depo employment um, uh, government employment bureau says that um, by 2020 49 percent of women will have degree level qualifications compared to just 44 percent of males so actually women are, are sort of more getting more educated than men but we're still not choosing STEM subjects and this really baffles me I get asked this question so many times in my working life why aren't women interested in STEM what's your female perspective on technology and I just I have no idea does anybody have any ideas just from a personal perspective I think you know, maybe this is a terrible gender uh, stereotype, but boys, like even from a very young age, I can see it more in children, like seeing how things work, you know, and pulling them apart and doing that. And some girls do, but I was never one of those girls. Um, I could never be bothered with those parts of the physics labs about that. I just thought, you know what, there's somebody who knows how that works. It's what you can do with it. And I know that that's a bit of a cliche, but that's to me a part of STEM that's often you know, forgotten about it. People love talking about the geeks, and that's a term I always get nervous about because, you know, you don't have to be a geek to work in STEM. But, it's, but there's nothing that we do um, in the world anymore that's not a digital element, and obviously IT is the where I am. And I think there's a huge opportunity for people to get engaged in that. And it's not just about, you know, it's, it's what it can do and the difference it can make. And perhaps if there was more of a focus on that, and, the, and you know, what science can achieve for focusing on women, that might engage more women into it rather than you know, just actually technically how you make it work. That's just a very important part, but it's just one part of it. I have to say as well, you know, I'm I'm heartened by what's going on 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 the web in terms of this. You know, there's a lot of big money players like Google at the moment putting their sort of all into trying to create content that appeals to girls. The Made with Code website is a perfect example. You know, it's a great. It's not girly, but it's got some really nice kind of like girly for want of a better word projects like making a 3D printed bracelet and stuff like that so it's got things you know and I know people will criticize perhaps that kind of gender geared um, sort of like projects but at the end of the day our children our teenagers are a product of growing up in a gender biased society you know we, we can't get away from that the 14 15 year olds no matter how much it upsets our sensibilities um, the young girls who are choosing to take STEM subjects for further education right now, they grew up 
with gender biases. And so, of course, perhaps gender specific things are going to appeal more to them at the moment until we overcome that. So I have a real problem with people who sort of get on their high horse about this sometimes going, we need to, you know, not it not be about gender. But actually at the end of the day, you know, if you're going to try and appeal to girls and that's what appeals to them, surely it's a it's a valid method for which to you to to spread the message, do you think? Yeah, I, I definitely do. I think for sure we are a generation in learning. Um, you know, I first started and we definitely had, you know, telex. We did not have a mobile phone. So I think we've got, you know, a generation in learning here and I think it will change and be very different as the next generation comes along and, and is not quite as uh, gender obsessed as we are in terms of who we put into roles and who we don't. Um, so I, I think it's all right to, to do what we're doing. It's a journey and it's not going to be perfect tomorrow or in five years time. Um, so I think it's a journey worth going on though, um, for sure. Yeah, it's a journey we absolutely have to go on because at the moment, you know, the, 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 the STEM subjects are looking set to implode in this country with the skills gap and the gender gap and gaps everywhere. You know, you're so busy looking around for gaps these days, it's hard not to fall into them. <laughs> um, okay, well, education, you know, is a massive subject and there's a lot of work to be done, but I know that a lot of work is being done at government level and also by a lot of businesses to try and tr try and fix that. So in some ways, we almost need to sort of not look at it so that it can be allowed to do its thing for a while. Um, one of the biggest problems which remains a headache across the sector though is sexism and discrimination, uh, right, you know, and it blows up particularly in the games industry, you know, we've heard a lot of vitriol and, you know, sort of horrible things going on and they, again, they spread through social media and get very, very high profile. Um, according to Women in Scientific Careers, which is a report by Andrew, uh, Andrew Miller MP, Chair of the Commons Science and Technology Committee, just 17% of all professors working in STEM subjects are women and the report criticises specifically biases and working practices that result in systematic and cumulative discrimination against women through STEM study and academic careers. Do we hold with that? Do we agree with that? Is that what's our own, I mean, you're, Jacqueline, you're in the boardroom. What, what's been your experience with discrimination and sexism through your career? Yeah, so it's, uh, in my career, I mean, I've certainly had, uh, you know, a few, but I, I have to say I've, I've had the easier things to deal with are when you know that there is sexism in place. Um, and that you, you know, I've had um, certainly in my career where someone has said to me, we don't have women on the leadership team, I hope you realize that. Um, and I've also had um, someone turn around and say, may I introduce you to our managing director? And the customer has turned around and said, oh my God, you're a woman. Um, so, but you know what? What's interesting, the gift and the miracle in that is that at least you know that's what they're thinking. Um, I think the harder thing to deal with is when you don't know what they're thinking and that's much much more tricky um, so you know the unspoken um, uh, you know I think issues against women are are much much more difficult I would much rather that the the, the bias was spoken out loud it, 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 and sometimes you can tell but um, do I do I operate in a male dominated industry I would say absolutely have I come across sex and discrimination for sure. Um, does it happen today? I think it probably does in, in, in any um, vertical. But what I would say is that we've got such a male dominated um, environment that you almost, you almost expect it, I think. Um, and I think you have to stand up and, and you know, make a difference and make sure that the, the gender balance is redressed by having you know, much, much more in terms of numbers um, at, at a higher level in the organization so that you change the culture because it's the culture that will make the difference um, at yeah. grassroots level, I think. Absolutely. And um, the UN launched a He for She campaign um, last month, which is, you know, the, the, it's all about gender equality. And their sort of key message is that the um, the responsibility for change doesn't just lie at the doorstep of the female of the species. Um, you know, and I think that's really important. That it's not just about women needing to change or women needing to action change, but actually that men have to take responsibility for their own part in this. 
Um, Anne, have you, have you experienced, what's your experience with sexism and discrimination? Have you felt it's held you back at all? Um, from a personal point of view, I haven't felt that it's held me back, although um, early on in my career I did work in very heavily male-dominated traditional environments where you did have to kind of avert your eyes from the um, this kind of the playgirl calendar and, and, and playboy calendar and, and things like that. Um, and I think you've just you just got to get on and do your job and, and show that you're, you're an equal. Um, but I think one of the, the positives is, is, as you say, it's everybody's responsibility. Um, and recently, some of the, the large STEM um, organizations wrote to, to David Cameron actually signing up to a 10-point plan around diversity and equality, actually show that, that they were starting to lead the way. Um, so as Jacqueline said, um, things are, are changing. It's it's turning a super tanker because we've got so many years of history of the the industry being traditionally male dominated. Um, but we are starting to see some improvements um, and some of the work that that is going on within SEMTA and some other STEM related uh, industries um, is around encouraging women to progress within their organisations. So there's career enhancements and and progression. Um, um, training that is available free of charge or subsidised within many organisations. Um, so I, I would say to anybody out there, please have a look, inquire within your organisation because if it is STEM related, there may be a programme in there um, that's suitable for you. And for many of the women that's been on the programme, it's actually been quite transformational um, in convincing them that they are better than they think they are. Mm. Yes, and 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 um, Alison Tony asks, are the big tech firms women friendly? Do you think we've reached the stage now? But we're hearing more and more, particularly about the tech firms, of them, you know, pushing the agenda of getting women into the boardroom. But are they really genuinely female friendly? Probably not yet, but hopefully getting there. Um, I think when people still come into our organisation and notice there's so many women, I think that suggests perhaps not. I truly, really have direct experience um, of of my own, but I think I, I think we do need to do some some you know positive discrimination to help change that because I think what happens is I don't think men always are consciously you know sexist towards women, but might do it subconsciously because. They're used to working in an environment that is all men and it's around how men work and that can just be frustrating for women. So until they perhaps act, until they actively understand and, and genuinely I think want to have women into that and, and actively look to, to change that, I think we've, we've got some way, way to go. And I think there are things you know that we haven't touched on, things like still seeing childcare as being the women's issue, I think is discriminating to men as much as it is to women. You know, I think there's lots of things like this. That, that, that needs to be addressed before we're, we're in a genuine place with equal opportunities for, for both. And there's a growing body of research as well. I mean, just one paper that's come out recently is Bridging the Gender Gap, Growing the Next Generation of Women in Computing. And that says that there's a 34% higher return on investment when women are in leadership positions and 40% higher citations for patents with women co-inventors versus male-only inventors. So surely... That has to be a good sort of sound business incentive to to redress your you know you'd have to be an absolute idiot to run a company and not want a you know a, a 34 percent higher return on investment hello um, okay well listen this is one of those topics which you know obviously we could just talk about all day and I've really enjoyed uh, chatting to you guys but we're, we're coming to the end of the program and I just want to really quickly I know that because my light has gone out I don't know if you've noticed my I kind of went a bit dim. Um, that's the lighting, not me personally. Um, so I want to just round off with our hot or not section. Um, there's loads of questions coming that we haven't got around to answering, but guys, please join the conversation on Twitter afterwards. That's the hashtag and the um, app that you need to use. Um, but we've got our hot or not. Have you all got your hot or not signs? Okay, so regular viewers, regular viewers, of this is our second episode, but if you viewed last time, then you will know that um, we're just going to fire off a couple of um, things around our topic and see whether our guests think that they are a good thing or a bad thing. We're going to start with Pink Stinks campaign. Now, this is the campaign, it kind of like really sort of took off a couple of years ago after the um, EU did that awful um, video 
promoting uh, women in science careers. It's science, it's a girls thing it was called. It was all pink and lipsticks and eye powder and stuff flying around. Um, and, and people started saying pink stinks. You know, you don't need to make things pink to interest girls. So what do we think of the pink stink campaign? Do we agree with it? Do, do we think it's hot that we don't need to make p things pink to interest girls? Or do we think it's, it's, it's not hot? Hot or not? Pink stinks. Not hot. Not hot. So now I'm going to come to you, Jacqueline, because I kind of agree with you, and I think we're probably, you know, and 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 also Alison, we're probably actually generally in the minority. You know, I actually think it's yeah. okay if you need to make something pink to attract a girl initially. Then what's the big deal? I like pink. I have pink headphones. <laughs> I prefer purple. I think we could be more imaginative of the pink, maybe a nice shade of teal or something a bit more trendy. <laughs> Colourful, yes, but please not pink. Please, no pink. <laughs> and Anne, you were the only you were the only hot. So you agree you agree with this? Um well I, I kind of was a bit hot or a bit not actually. I think certainly for very young girls, pink is everything because they're into the whole Disney characters. So for me, it was pink at that age, I think, is absolutely um, acceptable. And anything we can do to encourage them into STEM-related subjects, I think as they get older, I probably would go on to the, the not side and agree with Alison that let's choose a different colour to pink. But I think kind of having just gone through a, a birthday with my four-year-old great-niece and it was all about Frozen. I think pink's a difficult one to get away from at that age. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Kids are going to be kids, whatever you try. Um, okay, next one. This is an interesting one. Um, girls only coding classes and cubs, clubs. So creating an environment and only allowing girls to join and do coding. Is this good, hot, or bad, not? I'm going to say hot because I do think that sometimes it, girls need a space to be amazing um, and I think it's really important to, to, to offer them that space. Not exclusively, not always, but I think it is good to have the option. Yeah, and um, <laughs> Anne's the only one I <laughs> disagree with again. <laughs> Alison, why do, you think, why do you think hot? We shouldn't need it, but the reality, as we talked about earlier, is that it might help. And I think maybe we should have an opportunity for girls to have girls only, but then perhaps they can compete against the boys, and that might make it a bit interesting. But I think it's just a recognition of where we're at today, and I think it might encourage a girl who might not otherwise go. She might go if it's a girl only one. So if, if it helps, let's do it. And uh, Anne, not. You are our not. <laughs> Yeah, I guess it's picking up Alison's point about really we, we probably shouldn't need to do it and I think something like coding, particularly if you catch everybody at a very early age, um, doesn't seem to be STEM, it's that sort of that gaming environment that attracts everybody so for, for me it was are we creating our own stereotypes by actually splitting the groups up by gender but who knows it's one of those to try and, and, and see what works. Perfect. Okay, final for today then. Uh, this is, <laughs> I think I know what the answer to this is going to be. Hot or not, the Facebook egg freeze. Now, this was a story uh, that uh, I heard on the wires that Facebook was suggesting that, um, and I don't even know if it's, uh, if it, if it's um, you know, sort of been verified or not, but the idea that women of a certain age should be encouraged to freeze their eggs so that they can start a family later on in their life. For that to be suggested by a company to their employees, hot or not? Mm, big fat not. Yeah, I've even got an upside down <laughs> not. Oh, look at that though, and just to buck the trend, you've been like the, you've been the opposite of the other two. Um, okay, I know why Jacqueline and Alison said uh, not, but uh, Anne, really hot. Um, yeah, I mean I've. Well, given that when the story broke, I went on Sky News and I was doing the kind of the business perspective. Um, from my point of view, it does seem very bizarre because Apple were, were doing it exactly the same day. Um, but I think actually, if you look at it, that to some extent they've got to be applauded because they're breaking down every barrier possible in terms of career progression for women and keeping women in the workforce. Um, and the premise of the story was it, it was a number of different um, 
perks and benefits that they'd introduced actually to keep more of the women in the workforce and I think yeah it seems it seems quite bizarre but let's applaud them for being diverse and equality and and, and trying something different breaking down all the barriers I, yeah. I think you know, my, my view on that though is that there is so much technology out there where you can you know you know work where you are versus work in the workplace so you know there is lots of technology that enables remote workforces um, and I think that's a way to keep women engaged and have a family so I think the work better live better idea is super important and that we have technology that enables that we should embrace it absolutely and let's face it face Facebook as a platform is one that um, will remove an image of a breastfeeding lady because it shows a nipple and yet will allow atrocities like beheadings be posted so you know it's 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 one of those um, really thorny issues that you know so sort of it's difficult with Facebook isn't it it's very awkward um, okay well brilliant thank you so much I've really enjoyed chatting to you today uh, my wonderful guests Jacqueline Anne and Alison for sharing their insights and also to you for watching live and throwing your questions into the mix we're five minutes over but I hope you managed to stay with us um, and I hope that if you've enjoyed watching Digital Leaders TV, you will join us on Twitter to carry on the conversation and make a date to watch us next time. There'll be more information about what we'll be talking about um, throughout the coming weeks, so keep an eye on the Google Plus page. But in the meantime, thank you very much to my wonderful guests and to all you for watching. So until next time, stay connected. <laughs>